because sometimes you may not have problems but have issues and write those down because sometimes teachers are shying away teachers shy away from asking questions other times maybe there's a parent here and the question is regarding that parent so you don't want to ask that in public so write it down you don't even have to mention your name there put down the question three questions or three problems that are major for you the number one two three and then I'd like to collect them and then, you know, go over them, answering those uh, to the best of my ability. And also maybe some of the questions are going to be answered by some of your peers from here. So first, I'm going to ask you to please go ahead and write down three questions or three concerns or three problems that you're facing in teaching at IAGD Saturday or Sunday School. Let's go. Yes, sure.
In, in 30 seconds, we're going to start responding to the questions. So whatever questions you may have, please hand them in. Okay, if you have more questions, you can just put them right here. Let me look at some of the questions. Question number one is <clears throat> how to control the classroom in general? You know, I've been in education for about 30 years, and <clears throat> I'd always, when, when I was um, principal at schools, different schools, <clears throat> interviewing teacher, I'd ask them, at a given time, you have 25 students in the classroom. How many of them should be under your control? Guess what the answer is? All of them. They would say all 25 of them should be under my control. Then I say to them, that let's think about a scenario in which all those 25 children have the sense of self-control and they're under their own control and they're learning, they're managing their own behavior. How many of them should be under your control? Guess what the answer is at this time? None. So our job is not to control kids. Our job is to give the children life skills 101 so that they can manage their life themselves. And it starts from home. Of course, it starts from home. But then sometimes, though, kids don't get that uh, our training at home. So we, as weekend school teachers or regular school teachers and administrators, we have a big responsibility of not only teaching those children how to behave well, but also we have to do some of the raising and training even parents as to how to raise kids and unfortunately maybe so to speak raising parents because they don't use those skills whereby self-responsible kids are going to be coming out of their training. Therefore, our job is not to control kids. So when you say how to control the classroom in general, there are three things here. One, when we are in a teaching environment, we look at the student behavior, teacher behavior, and the overall classroom environment. When the kids don't behave, they are not to be blamed 100% because there may be many other reasons for why they are not behaving. It's not that they choose not to behave. You know, every behavior has a purpose. So when they're not behaving, you got to find out as to why. So how many of you talk to the parents about why they are not behaving? Well, first of all, though, even before you talk to the parents, talk to the child as to why is the child not behaving. Okay, so in public, though, humiliating kids is not a good idea. So you have to take time out to talk to them, not in public, but in private, and find out as to what the cause is, and be sure to respond to that. And also, so that's student behavior. About teacher behavior, how you plan and prepare for your classes, very important. How you provide your instruction, very important. One size does not fit all. Not, all. not all our kids have the same needs. Not all our kids learn the same way. Some of the kids may be global learners. Some of them are sequential learners. Some concrete, some abstract. Some of them, if you simply tell them, they will understand. Others, you have to show them how it works. Others, you have to put them in groups to be sure that they're involved in that conversation. For example, cooperative learning group. How many of you use cooperative learning group in your classroom? First of all, what is the difference between small group and cooperative learning group? If you put four or five kids together as a group, is that necessarily a cooperative learning group? The answer is no, because a cooperative learning group is the one in which every student has a role to play. So you put, let's say, four students in a group. One is the facilitator. One is the note taker. One is the presenter. One is the timekeeper. And then you rotate those roles. So there will be no way that they're not going to be involved. 
What do we do most of the time as teachers, educators? We lecture a lot. I was actually associated with this IEGD uh, uh, weekend school in 86, 87, around that time. So, you know, Brother Lot of Thamzabi, Sister Alima, Sister Farida, you know, they were, they were around at the time, Brother Salman and Sharif Jindi and others. So for the last 25 years or so, I have not been associated with the weekend schools. Things may have changed. So I need to know exactly what kind of situation is happening, what's happening in the classrooms, and how are they being addressed by the teachers. So the, the question, as I said, going back to the question how to control the classroom in general, it depends on those three things. Your planning and preparation, instructional strategies, and also how you assess your student learning. Any given time, if I, if I want to stop by your classroom and I ask three questions, what are you learning? Okay, how is your teacher going to find out as to whether or not you've learned the materials? Uh, homework or a test? Or a question? Question answer. What are we going to be doing next? After the question? Uh, discussing the answers maybe? Okay. All right. So at any given time, if I go to your classroom and ask those three questions, and students can answer those three questions precisely and promptly, and specifically and in a timely manner, then we know that instruction is taking place in the classroom. But in order for that to happen, the very first thing is planning and preparation. It takes a lot of time to prepare because not all kids in your classroom are at the same level, right? You have different levels. Some are at this level, some are at this level, some are at that level. And in order for us to be able to address all of them intellectually, emotionally, it is not one size that's going to fit all. That's why we have to be sure that we plan accordingly. And then instructional strategies, we have to make sure that we make, we make adaptations and accommodations for the kids. Because some of the kids that are, that are low level, you have to be sure that you customize your plan for them. Some of the kids that are at very high level, you also have to be sure that you have challenging instruction for them so that they are also being effective in the classroom. Keeping students busy is not our job. Being sure that they are all effectively engaged and they are all learning, that's what our goal is. So once again, controlling kids is not going to be our job, but be, making sure that we have a learning environment in which everybody is learning, that is our goal. Okay? Any questions or comments on this? Do you want it as a town hall style meeting, meaning we will ask questions and we'll try to respond them as a as a group. Yes, sister. You said we have to adopt an accommodative curriculum challenge. Right. Capable, because the curriculum we are providing, you know, it's just one curriculum for the whole class. Uh, you have to be able to flexible. You should be able to, you know, make some adjustments there because otherwise the kid at a lower level is going to be bored because he or she is not going to get anything. And that's why there ha you know you have to have room for flexibility the there. Exactly, exactly. Right. Right. We have to use flexibility there. First of all, we only have two kinds of problems in our classrooms. One, kids tuning out, two, kids acting out. So kids that are acting out, we see them what they're doing. But kids that are tuning out, sometimes you will not be able to figure that out because they're looking at you. They're looking at the, the whiteboard or smart board, whatever you have in front of the class. But you have no idea as to whether or not they're getting anything out of that. So that's tuning out. So those are the two major problems we have. Students acting out and tuning out. Now in order for us to be able to get them all on board, we must be able to Engage everybody, not just give them busy work, not worksheets, because I, I always say this, that worksheets don't grow dendrites. <laughs> right? I mean, giving worksheets is not going to do it. We have to actively engage everybody. And how do we do that? As I said, if you set up a cooperative learning environment in which you give them different roles,
they are going to be not just busy but effectively engaged because if you give them role okay you are facilitating you are presenting you are taking notes you are keeping time then obviously they are going to have something to do and if you rotate those roles they are going to be actively engaged in in doing what they're doing and once again the curriculum there has to be some ways to make adjustments there as an instructor you should have that flexibility to um, to uh, uh, you know make adjustments there so when you do your planning and preparation for the class that's when you're going to, you're going to prepare as to what you're going to do for a student who is at a low performing level and what you're going to do for a student at a high performing level and that is the major portion of teaching so as I said three things planning and preparation and then instructional strategies there are different strategies you can use number one most of the time as I said you use whole group instruction what I'm doing right now if sister Alima is not paying attention I have no idea whether she is learning anything or not right so what I do is when I do my formative assessment after five minutes or so I do question answer she doesn't raise her hand so she is off the hook I, I have no idea about her so instead of doing that sometimes we have a strategy of putting everybody's name on a basket or in a hat or you know uh, on, on an, in an envelope or uh, those um, sticks that people put their names you pull them out at random so that if sister Alima's name is there I say okay now it's sister Alima then she has to respond so she and, and everybody's going to be alert at the same time it could be me next that I have to answer that question so you're going to be alert and paying attention to what's happening so that's that's how you're going to get you know uh, people involved so that nobody what is it yes exactly that works because everybody is then going to be you know be sure that you know they're, they're paying attention and they're ready to to respond okay and so I as I said it, you know I would like to see when you did that the last time we had the workshop we shared some strategies with you those are called active learning strategies active teaching strategies and I'd like to hear from some of you whether you tried to use them and if you did with what success or if things didn't work what didn't work and why didn't they work yes Right. Thank you. Once again, you are referring to whole group instruction. Remember, there are different strategies: whole group, small group, cooperative group, think pair share. Right. All of those. Are you using all of them? Right. 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 Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Staring at them, proximity, right? Yeah, those things work, yes. But, but once again, as I said, those other strategies, instead of whole group, if you use small group or cooperative learning group, because sometimes people mix those things up, small group and cooperative learning group. Cooperative learning group is specifically about specifying roles. And as they're involved in the discussion as facilitator, you know note taker timekeeper and a presenter you go around and see what they're doing and then you change the ro those roles um, uh, in a, every 10 minutes or so there is no way they're not going to be involved once again as I said my experience is that most of the time we do whole group instruction think pair share is another very important strategy if you put two people together and give them a, a, a topic for example if I if I ask you this I'm going to ask you uh, to think about a scenario let's say this is you're attending your retirement dinner one of your former students is uh, going to speak about you about your teaching what would you expect to hear from that student and then I say well okay turn to your elbow partner and talk about it okay so how can you not talk about it as to what would you like your student to talk about you okay so you're going to be actively engaged make things interesting 
And when you put two people together, they may not be able to publicly express what they're saying, you know, when they're having conversation between those two. But they will open up there, and then what I say, well, okay, fine. Now I'm going to be looking for some risk takers. So I'm not going to force you or you or you to answer, but I'm going to ask you, what kind of conversation did you have? Can you hear some from some risk takers as to what, what you discussed about what would you like to hear from your former student? That's called think, pair, share. Now, in your instruction, you know, in Islamic studies, in Quranic studies, in uh, Islamic history, uh, you can, I, you know, can specifically choose a topic and then have students do either think, pair, share, or do cooperative learning, or do a small group, or mixed abilities group. As I said, some students are at this level, some are at this level, some are at that level. Mix them up. So the students that are at this level, they are going to be encouraged by the rest of them to be up to this or that level. Okay, that way everybody is going to be um, engaged in the in the uh, in the activity. So I think, yeah. I, I don't see two of the members looking around. My, my two other teachers are not here who, who, who shared two very good experiences. Uh, in one of the ninth grade uh, uh, history class, the uh, teacher basically created uh, five groups of the class. Mm -hmm. And uh, they were supposed to, uh, they were discussing Spain, uh, Muslims in Spain. And uh, he basically asked them to do individual tasks. And one was group was basically supposed to write about or talk about the uh, social aspect that changes within the Spain. Mm -hmm. uh, the other group talked about the, uh, the cultural issues mm -hmm. with respect to the music, art, culture portion. Right. The third talk about the academic or the, the, the portion, the education, the enhancement of scholarly activities. And uh, I remember uh, the presentation that they made and one of the, one of the things that they, we asked them is who actually worked in the group. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you that the student was very blunt. They were identifying that mm. uh, this guy never yeah. showed up in any meeting, right. he didn't contribute, he right. didn't respond. So, uh, it, I don't know what type of experience it would have been for the kid, but it was a great experience for the, the group itself. Mm -hmm. Right, right. And we don't want to undermine any of the students' participation. The student that is the least engaged student is also the one that we have to work on in getting him or her involved. But in front of the whole class saying that, you know, that, that Muhammad did not participate or, you know, Ismail did not do what he or she, he, what he is supposed to do, we are not going to do that. That means in front of the whole class, you are not going to talk students down. Because uh, you as a teacher, you have the power. And I, I, I say this often, that use your power to show them that they have the power within themselves to be successful. So instead of using your power to overpower them, use your power to empower them, meaning that they can all be successful. Because kids are, trust me, they're looking at you as their role model. What you say, how you behave, how you care about them is, is so very important. When, when, when I talk to the teachers, I ask them, what is your philosophy of education? I care about all kids, all kids can learn. Then I say, I'd like to hear from the students that they feel that they're cared about. That's the most important part. So if I feel that I'm caring and kids feel that they are not cared about, there is a problem. Most of the misbehaviors happen due to those three things not taking place uh, uh, the way they should be. As I said, number one, planning and preparation. If the planning and preparation is poor, it's not going to work well. Because as they say, if you fail to plan properly, you are going to plan on failing. And number two, instructional strategies, mix it up. Whole group, small group, cooperative group, think, pair, share, also individual work. I'm not undermining individual work. That's needed too. That's needed too. So these are the five different ways that you can provide your instruction. And then the most important thing here is that one size does not fit all. So you cannot just provide you know, uh, one level of instruction to cover everybody. So adaptations and accommodations at home, you write things down to be sure that 
this group of students, they're at a low level. How can I bring them up to the speed? So you come up with making some adjustment in your, in your planning. And then the third thing is uh, assessment. There are different types of assessment, as you know, like diagnostic assessment, formative assessment, and summative assessment. Diagnostic assessment is the one that you do very first day of school. You figure it out as to where the student is. Don't you give them a placement test? So that is the diagnostic assessment. And the next thing you do is formative assessment. As you provide instruction, as you do centers, or as you do group work, you, um, you have to figure out as to whether or not students are learning the material. So as they, as, 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 as they say, that formative assessment is like when the cook tastes the soup, and summative assessment when the customer tastes the soup, right? <laughs> so, so before you serve the soup to the customers, you want to taste it yourself, right? In other words, if, if every five, 10 minutes you check for understanding, when you give them the test, they are going to be ready. So what we usually do is instead of doing that five, 10 minute checking for understanding, we give them a big test at the end of the week or at the end of the month where there is no clue as to which part of it is that the students did not get at the time when you are teaching. Because you meet only once a week. And by the time you meet them next week, they forget most of the, most of the stuff. Therefore, it is not an easy job. It is, it, is a, it is a hard task to be sure that students are learning the, the material. So formative assessment is the process before you get to the summative assessment. So as I said, these are the three things you have to pay attention to, planning and preparation, instructional strategies, and also assessment. You have to customize assessment. You have to be sure that you are flexible in assessing your students. You are not going to assess all students the same way because they are not all at the same level. And also, I've seen the students are sitting there for 30 minutes or an hour. They have no break. Well, you don't necessarily have to stop teaching to give them a break. When you form groups, they're going to move around, right? From this group to this group, okay, there will be 10 seconds before you meet your next group and you give them the, rule, you know, the, the rules and the roles as to who's going to play what role. That way they have some bodily kinesthetic uh, activities in the classroom. So instead of keeping them sitting the way you are sitting here, you're adults, that's why you're behaving. <laughs> but speaking of behaving, <laughs> speaking of behaving, you know, about 15 years ago, I was teaching a class at Lisa. You know where Lisa is? Uh, Livingston Educational Service Agency in Howell, across the street from Howell High School. So I was training a group of teachers there, they're K-12 teachers. And one teacher came to me day one, high school math teacher. She tells me, uh, uh, Dr. Rashid, I have a disability. I cannot sit down for three to, more than three to five minutes at one place. So during your class, and it was a Monday, Friday class, five days, three credit hours, eight to four. <laughs> so, so she tells me that, is it going to be uh, disruptive? Is it going to be interrupting your instruction? If I just have said, you know, we are going to be learning as a team here. So let me do this. So, so I said to the whole group, I said, I have something important that I want to share with you. One of our participants in this group uh, is not comfortable sitting for too long. I didn't say she has special needs. I didn't say that because that would be undermining her. So yeah, she is comfortable walking around and participating. So when she does group work, if she gets up, walks around and come back, you know, we are going to understand that. So I'm going to just give you a heads up about this that, um, you know, uh, and then I gave the name of the participant that she is going to be, you know, doing this during group work or whole group or even think pair share she might say hey let's walk and talk <laughs> so you're all going to be understanding you know how the teachers are oh sure sure no problem we'll, we'll do that one more example Southgate there is a hotel if you go 75 south take north line exit turn right there is a hotel on the right hand side and I was training a group of teachers there that was also about a dozen years ago and um, what I usually do is when I give them a, an activity, I play some soft music in the background, Baroque music, and the participant manual tells me, the, 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 the uh, facilitator manual tells me that you play, play this music, tape A, when they're doing this. You play that music when they're doing that activity. So I was playing that music in the background. None of those 
people had any trouble except for one young man he was a high school music teacher at North Gross Point High School he comes to me and tells me that Dr. Rashid you know I am a music teacher and the music that's playing in the background is taking all my attention and I can't concentrate <laughs> so middle of the activity I say forgive me for the interruption ladies and gentlemen I am going to turn off the background music that I promised that I was going to be playing because we have uh, one of our participants who is not comfortable working when the music is playing in the background so I'm going to turn it off with all your permission say, oh no problem go ahead do it see these are examples of adults when we have students in our classroom how do you expect all of them to be just you know either a uh, uh, sequential learner or a global learner or concrete learner or abstract learner a lot of times if you keep talking no visuals are being used if we simply do whole group instruction no group instruction is taking place if we only do group instruction and no think pair share is taking place where they are going to be uh, 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 motivated to participate so if we use those then we can activate them so it's our job as educators to be sure that active everybody is actively engaged just blaming kids is not going to do it kids are not here that's why I'm saying that I'm not going to say that the kids are always well behaved neither are we adults are we no but then how are we being handled how are we being treated that's so very important too yes uh, like, can we have a break? <laughs> yeah sure sure okay no no yeah you're going to moderate yeah go ahead Back, as we announced before the break, that after the break we are going to hear some success stories from you. Uh, uh, okay, thank you. Yeah, no cream sugar. It's, yeah, no cream, no sugar. Thanks. You, you didn't have to though. Thank you. So, uh, yeah, so we're going to hear some success stories from you. All right, I'm going to bring the microphone here. Or if you come over here, that's fine too. Here you go. You know, I like to do usually uh, some different things. So this year I tried centers, you know, doing centers after whatever is today's lesson. So after today's lesson, I was, you know, uh, put the kids in uh, five or six groups and they will do different, you know, centers. So, but it will be, you know, uh, focus on the today's lesson. So it really helped me and kids were looking forward to it. You know, they really uh, liked working together as a group, you know, and if, one kid has a problem or something, you know, they will uh, ask, they can ask, you know, their, you know, classmate or something. So uh, it, it was a new addition and good experience for me. You know. So what did they do in the center? Can I ask? What yeah, the today, whatever is lesson, you know. What, so what activity did they do? Uh, it was, you know, prepared by me. It was prepared by me, you know, uh, the questions kind of, you know, fill in the blanks or whatever, you know, you can make uh, about lessons. So using centers is a good idea. That's where you are not controlling anybody and you are not, you don't even have to manage the classroom. It's going to be self-managed, meaning students are going to be talking to each other, one another in the group. And if somebody is not as active, you can say, hey, wake up, let's get involved. That kind of stuff. And it's better if it comes from their peers rather than from you. Because when it comes from the peers, they don't feel, thank you so much, they don't feel that, they don't feel that pressure when it comes from peers. Oh, okay, it's a friendly advice, you know, so they take it easily. So I think centers is a great idea of having successful instructional environment in the classroom. All right, who else want to share a strategy? Yes. You want to come, you want to come here and share or from there? Everybody. 
everything's ready. They, they pay attention while I'm giving lectures. And then everybody gets the chance to answer it. Another thing I do is repetition, in my opinion, is very important for students to learn any skill or any lesson. So I repeat whatever I teach, not just once or twice. Even before the quiz, I go through the whole thing. And I say, next week you have a quiz. And when they come for the quiz, I ask the class, did you prepare? They say, yes. I say, do you want me to go through everything again? And sometimes they say, yes. So we do that. Mm -hmm. and, and another thing is that sometimes I ask a student to be the teacher of the class. So they are in the front. And that way I know what they want from us to do. And sometimes we also give them paper and say, what do you want in a teacher? Write a, and then say. Exactly. Uh, and and the, the strategies that you shared, and I know you probably have more, but let me just go over those two you s just shared. One is, yeah. And I think that you, you have shared two strategies here. One is teacher-led question-answer. The other one is student-led question-answer. I think student-led question-answer is sometimes much more effective than teacher-led question-answer because they are much more comfortable in participating when a student is facilitating the process. That's number one. Number two, by doing that, you give the student some leadership skills as to how to facilitate a, a group meeting so when they are as young as they are. And that way they take the ownership of learning. So it's so very important that you do this. And about, and about. Give them also. Right, yeah. exactly. Yes. Wow, great. You sound like William Glasser, uh, who talked about five basic human needs that we all do have, like the, the students, the teachers, the adults, the youngsters all of them and you're covering all of them I'm, I'm so glad that you know that you shared this with us students have to have a sense of love and belonging to the classroom they have to feel like it's their living room they're comfortable in communicating with you and the other students so they have to have that love for the sunday school or saturday school they have to feel like that they belong to the school okay aha uh -huh. The second thing is, you, you mentioned, I'm going to just sum up what she said. The first thing is, students have to have a sense of love and belonging to the classroom because their needs are being met. Yes. Two, you are having some fun, you said, in the classroom, right? Fun meaning they're enjoying doing what they're doing because you have different, different kinds of things that you do. Sometimes small groups, sometimes large groups, sometimes just two of them together. All kinds of activities that you do, that's called... You, they feel that sense of freedom in the classroom. So love and belonging, fun, freedom. And then also they feel empowered because you give them that opportunity to flourish, the opportunity to be creative, the opportunity to, to even evaluate their own work, the opportunity to go in front of the classroom and facilitate the, 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 the class uh, question answer. And also the last thing is survival. They're emotionally, they feel like, they are doing good and of course physical survival they feel like hey I'm in my living room why not I why shouldn't I be learning so those five ba five basic human needs love and belonging fun freedom power and survival if we keep them all in mind when we are teaching we are going to have our kids feel like that they belong it's so very important you know people talk about motivating unmotivated students honestly when you say that you're starting off with the wrong premise because there are no unmotivated students. Everybody is motivated. Question is, are they inspired to do the right thing? <laughs> sometimes you will find them yes, sometimes you will find them no. So whose job is it to be sure that they're all actively and effectively engaged in the classroom? And in order for you to be really be sure that you have an effective learning environment, 
you have to follow those five teaching standards that McCrell comes out with. One is leadership. Leadership in the classroom and leadership in the building. You as a teacher, what role do you play when you have a faculty meeting? Brother uh, Ramsey mentioned some important things. We always try to look into, uh, you know, uh, what somebody is doing wrong. What Brother Sohel is doing wrong, I'm always trying to find that out. But what he's doing right, I try to remain ignorant about. And that is the problem a lot of times we have. So that's why leadership in the building is going to depend on having respect for each other, one another, listening to people. That's how we can improve. If, I all, if I'm always critical about other people, what's negative about Brother Sohel, that reason I'm using Brother Sohel's name is because I've been working with him for a while. And, and Sister Aziza and, and you know, Sister Alima, Sister Farida, she's not here. So.